Hey guys, what's up? Cassie West here. So I am going to be starting a new series on my channel called Maddening Cases Monday. So every Monday, I'm going to go into a criminal case that highlights the injustice within our justice system. This can range anything from police brutality to an innocent person being framed by the police and the judges. I mean, it, it gets very crazy. I refer to the series as Maddening Cases Monday because these cases will make your blood boil, just the injustice of it all. Although they don't all end in tragedy, there definitely will be cases where the framed or innocent person does end up getting killed or executed. But I will also be highlighting cases of victory where someone was wrongfully accused, wrongfully convicted, and against all odds were able to beat the system and get out walking as a free person. And I will also be doing those cases in between, cases where the person is currently fighting false allegations. They are currently in prison for an unlawful conviction or a wrong conviction, something that they were wrongfully accused of. These are people who need help and the best way to help them is to spread awareness about their case. So I wanted to start this series off on a high note and tell you guys one of those victory cases. So it is, a, you know, a spoiler alert. But um, this is a case of redemption, a case of perseverance, a very inspirational case of someone who against all odds came out on top and victorious. Justice was served and it's absolutely incredible. I've never heard anything like it. So I am talking about the case of Isaac Wright Jr. This is actually a case that 50 Cent is going to be making a drama series about on ABC. It's going to be premiering February 2020, so be on the lookout for that. Isaac Wright Jr. was convicted of being a drug kingpin in New Jersey, and as a result, he was given a life sentence. During the appeal process, he educated himself on the law, was exonerated of all charges, went to law school, came back and got the cops and the judge locked up that put him into prison. This story is incredible. And as of now, Isaac Wright Jr. is a practicing lawyer and has worked on several very important cases. But just so that you guys understand how big the opponent was that Isaac Wright was up against, I want to first tell you guys about his adversary, and that is Nick Bissell. So let's go ahead and get into it. Nick Bissell Jr. was born in 1947 to Nicholas L. Bissell Sr. and his wife Louise. He grew up in Woodbridge Township in New Jersey, but then he later moved to Somerville, New Jersey, where all this took place. Among those who know Nick Bissell, even from his childhood, a lot of them say that he was really all about appearances and that he really wanted fame from a young age. And he just thought that he would get that through his athletic ability. But the only downside was that he had a really bad throw and he wasn't very good at baseball. Or maybe he was good, but just not good enough to be like professional. So um, he never got the praise through sports that he just craved and really just needed to feed his pathology. So by the time he was a young lawyer in Somerville, New Jersey, he had put on a lot of weight and was really adamant about, you know, losing weight and getting in shape and, um, and basically just the weight gain in general kind of honed in on the truth that he wasn't really going to be some athletic superstar. But once he started practicing law, he realized that the courtroom, he could get the kind of attention and the kind of praise that he wanted to get on the sports field. Um, he really liked dramatic performances and, you know, really like drama filled cases. Um, there was like a murder conviction that he got where he um, did his closing arguments by pounding like a metal pipe on a table to just show everyone just how loud and vicious it was when 
you know, the victim was getting murdered. And according to what I read, it made the defense lawyers jump. So, I mean, I guess it worked. And a lot of the people that know him from this time say that his rapid success was you know, to his own de detriment. And by 1982, he was already appointed the chief prosecutor by Governor Thomas H. Keene. And he was only 35 at the time. So, you know, this was a very young, successful man. Once he got this position, he became a very feared prosecutor in Somerset County because he was known for his, you know, harshness toward drug dealers. Um, you know, he had a loyal following of those people who were like tough on crime. And um, he also had a magnetic personality. And he capitalized on the attention. So he really craved attention and he really craved power. Obviously, being a prosecutor is not a good position for somebody like that, but whatever. Mr. Bissell, as we'll call him, or Nick, he definitely had a taste for the finer things in life. And he shared that with his partner in crime, who was his wife, Barbara. So with Barbara, he had two teenage daughters, and he also had one son from a previous marriage. But a lot of the crimes that I'm going to be going into today, Barbara is also complicit in, or many suspect that she was also, you know, an encouraging factor in, in a lot of this. So Barbara is a former legal secretary, so they met through like the legal world, and she was just always pressuring him to get more of the finer things in life. She was a very materialistic woman, um, you know, as was Mr. Bissell, and their greed is ultimately what led to their untimely de demise. Like I said earlier, he was known as the law and order guy. He was really big on indicting drug kingpins, sex offenders, murderers, which obviously the sex offenders and murderers I'm okay with, but his main thing was civil forfeiture, which is one of the most corrupt aspects of our, you know, criminal justice system and our police forces. And, um, the reason why is because he was doing schemes. Um, he had quite the motivation. He was skimming off the top. This is how he was getting a lot of money. And he really viewed this position as the chief prosecutor as a way for him to live the fine life, the high life. He wasn't, you know, excited about like getting justice for people or helping victims or anything like that. This was never in his like ethos. He just was very concerned with living a good life as was his wife, Barbara. Mr. Bissell was so obsessed with gaining wealth through a civil forfeiture that him and one of his old buddies, um, Mr. Thornburg, Richard Thornburg, who was like a previous football star, um, they would work together, sometimes even trying to lure drug kingpins to come to their county so that he could then, you know, entrap them and get to seize their assets. And later on, this Mr. Thornburg would actually testify against Mr. Bissell and say that he planned to frame a Somerset County judge who had displeased him by making a ruling in a case that was unfavorable to the prosecution. So this is a guy who he could have someone he knows is innocent. He knows for a fact is innocent. He knows for a fact he doesn't have evidence against. But just for the sake of getting a conviction, just for the sake of lining his pockets and, and being known as the best, he would send people to jail for the rest of their lives and not think anything of it. In fact, be happy about it. So this is a very like evil man. So just to give you guys an idea of the timeline, Isaac Wright, who this story is about, his initial arrest was in 1989. Now in 1990, there was a forfeiture case that proved to be Basile's downfall. So this is what ultimately got the dominoes folding like against him. And on May 10th, 1990, James Guffrey was arrested on charges of selling $700 worth of cocaine. Basil said he would drop the charges if Guffrey forfeited two plots of land to the prosecutor's office valued at $174,000. 
They were sold at auction below their appraised value to a friend of Bissell's chief of detectives. Guffrey filed a civil suit against Bissell, which the Somerset County freeholders later settled for $435,000 and also then contacted the Internal Revenue Services and the FBI. Forensic accountants with the IRS discovered that Bissell skimmed cash from a gas station of which he was part owner. The FBI also discovered that Bissell had destroyed a suspect's written request for a lawyer, and he threatened to frame his gasoline wholesaler for cocaine possession. It took, you know, several years of investigating, but in 1995, Bissell was indicted on 30 federal charges of mail fraud, tax evasion, abuse of power, and he was promptly, he was promptly fired, he was promptly fired by Governor um, and Somerset County resident Christine Todd Whitman. So in May 1996, he was convicted on all charges and he faced a minimum sentence of six to eight years in federal prison and a maximum of 10 years. So this guy was facing a maximum of only 10 years. So keep that in mind. Now, he was released under the condition that he wear an electronic bracelet, um, you know, until his sentencing, but he abruptly cut it off. And on November 18th, 1996, he fled to Nevada, where he um, let a note that he stated that he intended to commit suicide and he fatally shot himself after a 10 minute standoff in his hotel room where he told, you know, the police and the um, negotiators, there's no way I can do 10 years. I just can't do 10 years. I can't do 10 years. According to authorities, that was Nick Bissell's final statement just before he took his own life inside this Nevada hotel yesterday morning. The U.S. Marshal said today Bissell was traced to the hotel after the former prosecutor made several calls from his cellular phone to New Jersey. Marshals are still in possession of Bissell's body and as of now are giving no indication when it might be released to his family. It's still hard for many to understand why a county prosecutor, a leading law enforcement officer, would also lead a life of theft and deception. Today, Governor Whitman said she finds the entire incident disturbing and feels for his family. Uh, they have to live with this for the rest of their lives. They would have had some dignity had he come back and served his sentence and then come out and, and tried to make a life again. They would have had a, a positive role model. Now they're left with a with just awful burden to bear. When Bissell was convicted in June, a federal judge believed that his religious beliefs would prevent him from ever acting out against himself and that his love and concern for his family would also stop him from inflicting any type of self-harm. He does not appear to be depressed and denies suicidal thoughts. Based on that evaluation, Bissell was granted bail. A spokesman for Salamak today said he would not comment on the assessment. UMDMJ forensic psychiatrist Stephen Semery, however, said while he was not surprised by Bissell's suicide, he does not find fault with federal evaluations. The problem is not the psychologist who saw him. The problem is not the federal justice system. The problem is that someone as arrogant as Nick Bissell was allowed to operate with that kind of unbridled power for so many years. So think of how just evil this is. This guy finds the thought of doing 10 years to be a fate worse than death. Like to him, this is a fate worse than death. He literally shot himself. He killed himself. He committed suicide. Nick Bissell did. This man, without a second thought, sent countless people to life sentences, to 20-year sentences, 30-year sentences, without thinking an, anything of it and just happy that it helped line his pockets and, help, and helped get him more power. And it's not like he just doesn't think prison or jail time is that big of a deal. He thinks it's so horrific that he would not even, he would sooner die than do a decade. It just goes to show how subhuman he viewed the people that he was sending off. There's just no sense of empathy, no sense of sympathy, no sense of guilt. It's, it, there's nothing like that. All right, so as for Mr. Bissell's wife, Mrs. Bissell, she was also convicted and had to serve a prison sentence. So she was initially facing 41 months, but the judge reduced it down to 27, citing, you know, her two daughters that she had and the trauma that they had already all been through because of the dad's suicide. So she only ended up serving or getting sentenced to 27 months with the possibility of, um, 
you know, getting out four months early for good behavior, but I don't know if she ended up doing that or not. But anyway, so she did get punished for this as well, but I just find it insane that these people sent others away for life and they get like three-year sentence, 10-year sentence when they were sentencing other people to life in prison. Like, it's insane. (sighs) Okay, anyway. So one of these cases, one of these drug kingpin cases that Mr. Bissell was a part of happened to be that of Isaac Wright Jr. Okay, so just to put this into perspective... (laughs) It's just so crazy. Um, But just to put this into perspective, Isaac Wright was serving a life sentence plus 72 years for being a drug kingpin. And this Nick Bissell was only serving, would have only served, I mean, he ended up committing suicide, but he would have only served 10 years. I feel like especially when you have public servants like lead prosecutors when they are found to be part of corruption because they're held to a higher standard and because they have that power over people, they should be more harshly punished. But maybe that's just me. (laughs) But I feel like, um, you know, they should at least get the sentence that they were trying to wrongfully put other people away with. So if they were trying to, you know, plant evidence to put someone else away for life that was innocent, then they should get a life sentence. They should have to do what they would have done to somebody else. So once they found out that this Nick Bissell guy was corrupt, they had to go through and look at all of his cases. One of those cases was Isaac Wright Jr. So his story starts in 91 when he was wrongfully accused of being the main divisor behind a drug conglomerate. And I think he was really young at the time, like 20. So, I mean, maybe there's drug kingpins that are really young. I don't know. I guess maybe I'm not as knowledgeable about the drug world. (laughs) But I just kind of imagine that being like an older, like an older grandpa type guy that's like the kingpin. So, I don't know. But anyway, they were saying that that this 20-year-old guy was like this drug kingpin. And he was convicted under New Jersey's very specific kingpin law and he served as his own lawyer in his case and he lost and was sentenced to life in prison however like he didn't give up obviously or else we wouldn't be here so Wright constructed a legal tactic and formulated a defense um, to counter the kingpin charge or the kingpin conviction and um this method and his choice of going about it this way was instrumental to him getting freed. Because the jury instruction was flawed and it did not comport to the legislative intent, they had to throw my kingpin conviction out. Because that didn't mean you were kingpin. I don't understand why they had to throw it out. Because, no, no, I was, the, no, I was, in other words, what was said, this is, the law is a funny thing. The law says this, case law, not, not, not statutory law, but case law law that the actual courts make. Case law says that it doesn't matter how guilty a person is if the jury is not explained um, correctly about a particular law there's, or a particular crime, there was no way to tell whether they actually did find the person guilty based on, on, on correct reasoning. That's, I'll, I'll give you an example. I'm going to show you something. Let's say I gave you instructions on how to drive a car, right? And you get in, and, but the instructions that I give you is not correct. But still, at the same time, you get in that car and you make it from point A to point Z. That doesn't mean that when you made it to point A and point Z that you abided by all the laws. That means that you got, you may have gotten lucky. You see what I'm saying? So, so, so. Only if I was explained, only if I explained everything to you properly, what a person can tell, viewing all of that, whether you did everything correct. And they look at the crimes the same way. Even though a jury may find a person guilty of a crime, if that crime is not explained to them correctly, there's no way to tell whether or not their verdict was based on a correct understanding of the law. Wright was able to convince one of the officers that was under 
um, Basel to confess. Like, this officer um, confessed on his behalf when conducting when conducting a cross-examination on his own case. He was able to extract a confession from veteran police officer James Dugan. And this is what solidified his freedom. So this was during a 1996 evidentiary hearing and Wright, um, when Wright was cross-examining James Dugan. And basically, he uh, pointed the finger specifically at um, Nicholas Bissell, the, the head prosecutor, and um, also to wider... Uh, systematic misconduct, um, you know, all throughout Isaac Wright's case. And um, Bissell was fingered for being the orchestrator of the misconduct, directing police officers to falsify their police reports. Um, You know, he dictated false testimony of witnesses and made secret deals with defense attorneys to um, have their clients provide false testimony to jurors that um, Wright was their drug boss. And they had also pled guilty and were facing prison time. So he like made these deals with them. But basically all the all these stories were completely fabricated. And so Dugan pled guilty to official misconduct in order to escape prison. And the judge who oversaw the trial was removed from the bench and sent to prison for theft charges. So this is also around the time, um, you know, after learning about uh, Dugan's confession on TV, that's also when Mr. Bissell, um, that's, so after hearing about Dugan's confession on TV, it was after that that Nick Bissell took off his, um, you know, monitoring bracelet and fled to Nevada to commit suicide. So he knew that he was in a lot of trouble. But all in all, because of Nick Bissell's lies and him um, making illegal deals with other attorneys and falsifying documents and police reports and everything like that just to get a conviction, Isaac Wright spent seven years in prison. But in the time that he was there, he was studying law and his efforts led to either the reduced sentence or um, exoneration of 20 other inmates. So Isaac Wright wasn't just helping himself. This guy was like a legal savant or something like he and if you hear interviews of him, which I can play one for you, it's like he he can see a situation and just like find like this crazy loophole or full or immediately be able to tell if there was any misconduct or, you know, violation of the law because he's just that knowledgeable about it. So he's a very, this guy's like a legal genius. So this Nick Bissell guy messed with the wrong man on the wrong day when he decided to go after Isaac Wright Jr. But I'm going to take it one step further and sue these cats. So I was actually fighting the criminal case and the civil suit at the same time. Um, so when he came up as in my civil suit, I was doing all the work for my wife, all the legal work and stuff for my wife. And the lawyers had a problem with that because they said that I was committing a crime. I was actually engaging in the unauthorized practice of law. You can't act as an attorney if you're not licensed to practice law. The only person that can do that, you can do it for yourself because you have a constitutional right to do that. Every person has a constitutional right to represent themselves. So, so they wrote the judge, and the attorney general wrote the judge that, uh, from the governor's office. All the lawyers involved with the counties and the police wrote the judge, and the judge said that they wanted he wanted a legal argument on the issue. The judge said that he was inclined to believe that that, that it's a crime for me to do that, but since they made it an issue, just submit papers. So what I did was I went back to I went back three, four hundred years ago starting with the relationship between husband and wife. Now, in the Bible, 2,000 years ago, there's a, there's a, there's a, 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 um, a phrase that Jesus said that when a man and a woman joins, they become one person. English common law, which began in the middle of period 300 years ago, adopts all of those commandments and laws as they own. All the laws was based on morality. So English common law viewed a husband and wife as one person when they're married. 
That's why, if you remember, women used to be owned by men when they married them. And if women had any property when they married a man, their property became the man's property. Well, when this country began in 1776 and it began its independence and, and started their constitution, they adopted all the common law of England into the federal constitution. When the states gave their constitution, they adopted those same laws in their constitution. So the laws that they adopted in the constitution said that when a man and woman becomes married, they're one person. So I told the judge, based on, based on, based on biblical law, which was adopted by the medieval English period, which was adopted by our constitution, that a man and woman is one person. If they deny me the right to represent my wife, they're denying me the right to represent myself. You understand what I'm saying? Right. <laughs> how, long did it take to, how long did it take them to reverse that decision? Right there, that day, or? Uh, well, they held a hearing. There was a hearing, and the judge looked at all the briefs, and she was like, um, well, he was like, um, uh, you know, the argument is brilliant, da 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 um, and I'm going to let you continue doing what you're doing. So, I was able to go ahead and represent her from that point. But that's just to give you an understanding of how, how detailed and intricate, the theoretical and business, philosophical the law is, and how many people, I could, I'll put it to you like this, thousands and thousands of people can be released from prison right now. On, on issues that lawyers look over every single day. After he got out of prison, he spent another seven years pursuing his law degree. So he got his undergraduate in 2002, and he began law school in 2004, and he graduated from St. Thomas University School of Law in 2007. And at this time, he was about 34 years old. The law school that he went to actually named their cafeteria after him. So that's like how infamous this guy was. Now, Isaac Wright was able to pass the New Jersey bar in 2008, but he spent the next nine years being investigated by the New Jersey Bars Committee on um, grounds of like them investigating his character. I mean, as if these guys have a good taste in character anyway, but luckily that they ended up realizing that that was ridiculous. And after seven years, they finally gave in and were like, okay, fine, we can swear you in. And um, he was officially sworn in as a licensed attorney. And Wright says that he went to law school for one reason and one reason only, and that is to slay giants for a price. And if the giant is big enough and the cause is important enough, I'll do it for free, especially when it involves helping those who cannot help themselves. And, um... I love it. I love it. I love that. <laughs> because there's nothing that makes me more sick than like people being oppressed and having the freedoms taken away or injustice. Like injustice just makes my blood boil. Like I can't handle like I feel it. Like I have yeah. I mean I can't even dwell on this stuff for too long. It just it it it'll make you go insane. <laughs> you just have to do what you can do. But um but yeah, as of now, uh, Isaac Wright has worked on a couple pretty well-known cases and him and 50 Cent, which I think 50 Cent's name is like Curtis. So him and Curtis, 50 Cent, are um, making a movie, uh, not a movie, sorry, a, a drama series called For Life that is going to be showing on ABC starting February 2020 and it looks awesome. Uh, I... We'll show you guys this, um, this clip. I used to be just like you. I had a wife I loved. I had a family and a home. But then something happened. Now I, Aaron Wallace, am serving a life sentence for something I didn't do. You're broken down and tired. Today, for the first time, I've got a way to fight back. Becoming a lawyer is what's getting me out. How are you here? Hard work and goodwill. What's your method? Tell me how the hell this happened. So apparently we figured out some totally insane loophole in the system. 
You should have taken the plea. It was 20 years, Marie. I would have waited for you, and Jasmine would still have her father. Just watch your back. He'll crush any chance you have of getting your own case to court. I'm not stopping. Everything I do is about getting back to my family. It's a blessing, Dad. But you have to get out of here to be a part of it. I'm going to need you. Now, there will be no more long game. They move people around like they're pieces on some chessboard. But that kid right there is not some pawn. You Biding my time. This is my chance to make things right. So you go live your life, man. Whatever it takes, whoever I have to fight, I will get home. He was granted admission to the bar by the New Jersey Supreme Court on September 27, 2017, where he was officially sworn in as a licensed attorney. And it, and it was the same courtroom that he was wrongfully convicted in. So um, he was now returning to that same place as an attorney. So it's a really great story of redemption. Like I said, this is going to be a show on ABC. I'm certainly going to watch it because I would like to know more about writes um personal life and and backstory and just like how the arrest and spending seven years in prison and um you know fighting the system how that affected him personally because i think that that would be really interesting too but there's not really anything like that online he really made it his purpose that he was not only going to get himself free but he was going to help others. He was going to help others in the future that, you know, found themselves in a position where they couldn't help themselves. And he was going to punish those who had stolen his freedom. Okay, so when all was said and done, the cop that um, put false evidence and a false police report pled guilty to evidence tampering. The judge uh, found a prison cell and they had to step down, and um, Nick Bissell killed himself. I mean, those were the key players in um, not just Isaac Wright's false conviction, but I'm sure many, many others. This is like a really good story of redemption. It's, it's super similar to <laughs> the fictional story Shawshank Redemption, where you know, the the guy kills himself in that too, you know, when he realizes that everything's coming apart. So, I mean, this is like a real life Shawshank Redemption, but even, even more crazy. All right. Well, thank you guys for listening to that case. I just thought it would share it. I found it really inspiring, really inspirational. I guess that's kind of the same thing, but I found it very inspirational and, um, I think it's a great story of, um, you know, a great example of injustice within our justice system. But also, I think it's a good thing to start off with because um, it reminds us that there is still hope. Like, you can actually change things, maybe not all the time, but sometimes you can. And um, it's good to remember that so that you just don't totally give up and feel like everything's hopeless. Yeah, so let me know if any of you guys have heard of the show. It's called For Life. And if you are planning on watching it, I definitely want to check it out. It looks really good. So you'll have a wonderful rest of your afternoon, and I will talk to you later. Bye.